Some consumers prefer ride-hailing services like Uber or Lyft. It's half the price, so, no. I mean, there's no other reason than that, honestly. While others think a taxi is better. It's very convenient. Is it more convenient to say like Uber or Lyft? I think it is. Ride-hailing companies have staked a claim in an industry long dominated by taxis. Can they coexist? And what is government's role in this battle? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. They're called Transportation Network Companies or TNCs, better known as ride hailing services and most commonly known as Uber and Lyft. Through websites and mobile apps, a TNC pairs a passenger with a driver who is willing to use his or her own personal vehicle to take you where you need to go. They can be faster, less expensive, help with traffic congestion and serve areas that are not regularly served by taxi cabs. But are they safe? TNCs don't have the rigorous regulations that taxi cabs are subject to, including insurance, tax, and vehicle inspections. The taxi cab industry sees it as an unequal playing field. The TNC sees it as independence. We'll hear from the head of a ride hailing service, the CEO of a cab company, the director of the Honolulu City and County Department of Consumer Services, and a consumer who uses both transportation services. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. Show, you can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Tabitha Chow is the head of Uber in Hawaii and also manages Uber's government affairs and policy throughout the islands. Dale Evans is the CEO of Charlie's Taxi, the oldest taxi company on Oahu, founded by her parents in 1938. Sherry Kajiwara is the director of the city and county of Honolulu's Department of customer services, her department manages rules re relating to the regulation of private transportation services and drivers. And Derek Gabriel moved to Hawaii in 2002. He's the co-founder and CEO of a tech consulting company. He uses as the services of both taxis and ride hailing companies. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, Dale, I want to start with you. You've been in this business for a long time. Tell us what you see as the primary difference between between a traditional taxi cab and a ride hailing service? Well, the rules are different. The uh, requirements, we have been an open entry uh, uh, city, probably one of the few in the whole world be since December 6th of 1938. And basically at that time, they deregulated the medallions or the limitation of taxis. So we've been open entry ever since. The only rules that we had were about the driver and the car standards and basic operating rules against discrimination and overcharging. Tabitha, what do you see as the biggest difference between the two? Um, you know, I don't know if I would necessarily say that, you know, there's a ton of huge differences here in Hawaii. I would say that we're all a part of a transportation ecosystem. I think that we provide another option to riders and um, some people prefer to take, you know, ride hailing services as you mentioned and some prefer uh, street hailing with taxi. Okay, and from the city's perspective, what's the difference? Well, we want to look at what consumers want to use. And then what we need to do is develop rules that make sure that it is safe and that everything is equitable. So that's the direction that we want to move toward. As a customer, what do you think is the difference? Depends on what time of day it is. <laughs> Depends on where I'm going. Uh, and if I'm alone or if I have other people with me. So there's a number of different factors. You know, there are people who are loyal to one over the other. Why do you choose both? C can you give us examples of when you'd use one over another and why that would be better? Yeah, yeah. If, if you're in the, in the deep urban core, you know, if you're downtown or Waikiki, sometimes the taxi is much more available. You know, they're waiting in line at the hotels or restaurants. Uh, and other times, uh, I live in Salt Lake, and uh, it's often easier for me to get an Uber or Lyft um, out of there than it would be to wait for a cab to show up. Dale, we've talked about the idea of it being an unequal playing field. Do you feel like it is level for a taxi driver versus an Uber or a Lyft driver when it comes to making an income here in Hawaii? No, it's different. The, uh, in, in the, as a matter of fact, the insurance law requires the drivers to have $100,000, $300,000 of insurance 
So it costs the driver about five or six thousand dollars a year, whereas the Uber and Lyft drivers don't have to have that kind of insurance. It's lower because the state legislature let them off. What would you like to see? How could we remedy that? Well, actually, you know, my main concern are the industry lobby made basically for consumer protections. Insurance was one. The fingerprinting was another. The doctor's examination and the lab test was another. And then the um, price gouging was the other. Tabitha, what, what's your take on that? If I'm in an Uber uh, and we get into an accident, absent that kind of insurance, what happens? Uh, yes, so to clarify, the, um, the insurance that Uber drivers have available for every single trip from start to finish is actually a million dollar policy. So it's well above the, the taxi cab limits here in Hawaii, and that is uh, dictated and controlled by state law. So there is a state law in place that we, we do abide by, and it's a million dollar policy. So how does that actually work? If I'm an Uber driver, do I need to disclose to my, uh, to my insurance company? Do I need to call Island Insurance or? Or State Farm or whoever my provider is, or is that done through through Uber itself? Right, so we partner with individual drivers. So every driver that partners with Uber is an independent contractor. And the way it works is we verify all of their documents. So we make sure that they are legal to drive in Hawaii. And as a part of that, to drive in Hawaii, you need to have personal insurance. So we do verify that they have that insurance. Um, but then in addition, we, we do a background screening as well. We, we check uh, local, state, federal, um, sex offender registry, terrorist watch list. We, we do all these things to sort of screen the person and then in that partnership with us when they are using the app then um, our our insurance policy is the one that's in play. So if I'm an Uber driver I'm not necessarily on the hook if I get into a car accident for the safety of my passengers it would be Uber itself. Right so if something were to happen and you um, filed a police report the the insurance information that you would get would be the information from Uber. Okay. What's the city's take on that? I mean, is that enough? Do we need to have more regulations so that there, you know, so that it is the same? You know, one of the biggest differences, Angie, that I notice is that for taxis, because this has been an industry, we had uh, insurance requirements in place, as Dale mentioned, and that was sufficient. What we felt was good, but with Uber and Lyft coming onto the scene, many of them were part-time drivers, and as you mentioned, they used their own cars. So the state legislature had to look at a way to address the insurance needs when it's a business versus when you're driving personally. And I think the state legislature decided on a million dollar policy when the app was in play. But if you're driving your family or if you're out on the weekend and you're not working, then your own insurance comes into play. The problem is we have to have a way to ensure when it's turned on and when what insurance is turned on or off. I think that's the question that we need to make sure we, we fully address as to when they're covered. How has this impacted your business, the, the influx of these companies? Well, actually there are, according to the testimony, there are 7,000 TNCs, 5,000 Ubers and 2,000 Lyfts. There are probably about only 1,000 taxis left. In 2016, there were 1,800. So the, there is 7 to 1 to, uh, Lyft and Uber against the taxis. But may I clarify about the insurance that, uh, that she mentioned? The thing is that a million dollar coverage only applies if there's a customer in the car. It doesn't apply to others, and that's the way the law reads. Uh, Tabitha, I want to give you a chance because I see. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, that's inaccurate. <laughs> so it it actually it starts from the moment that the driver um, accepts a trip. So before the passenger gets into the vehicle, that million dollar C million dollar policy is in play, and until the moment that the trip is ended. So when the person exits the vehicle, that's the million dollars. That's the city's understanding as well. And, yep. and so I think this kind of goes back to what you were saying as to when this is turned on and turned off, because if I'm driving an Uber and I haven't accepted a ride, am I an individual, am I a business? Like what, that, that, that does feel kind of like a gray area. Yes, it, there does seem to be a gray area, but from, for now, I, my understanding is as soon as they accept a ride, whether the customer is in the car or not, when they're headed somewhere to take that cust to pick up that customer, the insurance policy, as required by state legislature, is in play. Yeah, but the law is, doesn't read that way. 
Well, obviously we have a different <laughs> opinion on this, but I want to go back to what you were saying about the numbers because that's quite a dramatic decrease in drivers. What are you hearing from drivers themselves? What are the, what's their experience? Well, they can't survive because the thing is that the see under the taxi law you can only have one rate. So most of the taxis are minivans; they are large deluxe vehicles. Uber and Lyft uh, use that as what they call Uber XL or Lyft. But the thing is that there's Uber X, and the thing is that the taxis cannot run a lower rate because that's what the, uh, the ordinance says. You can only run one rate. So if the taxis were allowed to do different rates, like they have Uber XL, Uber X, Uber Select, Uber Black, they all charge different rates. The taxi can only charge one. Have you seen drivers have to, have to quit? Oh, yes. In fact, one of them committed suicide. Wow. Um, well, I, we, we obviously want to get uh, you to participate in this discussion, so send us your questions and keep those phones ringing. We do have some of you. And uh, this, this person called in to say, for, the, for you, Tabitha, how do you regulate the safety of riders? I know you did mention some background checks, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure that the, that the individual is, is thoroughly checked and is a safe person to get into a car with? Absolutely. So in addition to the background screenings, you know, that's something that happens before the ride. So we take safety um, as something that's not something that happens only during a ride, but it should happen before and after a ride as well. So there are several things we do there. Before the ride, there's things like the background screening to make sure that the driver that you're getting into this vehicle with, uh, we do annual background checks on that person, and those are according to uh, city ordinance that we have. They're the same as the, the taxi ordinance as well. Um, and then, you know, while you're on the trip, we have features and we're constantly building new features based on feedback, based on things that people just say they'd like to see. Uh, one of my favorites is share your ride. So if I'm in a vehicle, I can share uh, my GPS uh, information with my mom and I can let her know when I'm going to be home so she can see exactly when I get home. Um, I can also during the ride I can contact support. We have a, a easy link to contact 911 if you ever have an emergency and you need that quick access. Um, and then after the ride that's when our feedback loop is so important and so at the end of each ride you have the option to rate your driver and you can leave feedback as well and so if there's anything that you would like to see different um, people let us know and every single thing that comes in is reviewed by a person and so we look through those we take feedback very seriously um, and we action upon it. Uh, Dale Carolyn wants to know and this is sort of uh, piggybacking on that is there a significant difference in the training offered to taxi drivers versus Uber or Lyft drivers what's your understanding on that? Oh yes uh, our our drivers take about 40 hours of classes and we have different types of orientation we take them on ride-alongs and then we have a driving simulator to test them on their ability on different scenarios. And then, of course, we have multicultural training. We have training as far as how they handle people with uh, disabilities. And uh, we train them on different ways of using the, the equipment that's in the car. Um, and Chad's writing in to ask you a question, asking, does the city maintain a database of Uber and Lyft drivers so police can locate them if, they're, if necessary? Well, in the past, we did have a database of taxi drivers, but with the new law that was passed uh, with the council, we now maintain a database of companies, and we have made it the company's responsibility to keep track of their own drivers, and if there's a complaint, I'm very confident that, uh, and we've had some instances where I needed to know who a driver was, and I would turn to each company, and they are supposed to provide the information at that time. Do you feel safe, Derek, in one versus the other? I mean, as a as a as so as a customer, is there what is the experience like? Do you prefer one well, or the other? I have a skewed view on safe because I'm six <laughs> four, almost three hundred pounds, <laughs> and I frequently walk around uh, in Waikiki and uh, feel safe, and people tell me they don't. So, um, but yeah, no, I mean, um, I personally haven't had any issues. Uh, I had a, an awkward cab ride uh, in, uh, uh, in L.A. one time, but that was, you know, <laughs> in a crazy city, right? Like, um, but no, I, I don't think there's a huge difference. I wouldn't say I feel safer in one or the other here. What about your overall customer experience? I mean, just the ride itself. Do you feel like there's a big difference between taking one versus another? Um, 
It, it, well, it varies, right? It, it, each ride varies. Um, but I, I want to kind of go back to training real quick because I had once heard that taxi drivers, is it part of a test or the licensing where they have to identify um, Hawaii landmarks, certain landmarks or something? Oh, yes. Sir. Okay. See, and, and that was something that I enjoy about cabs is that I haven't ever really had a problem with cab drivers not knowing where something was, especially like in Waikiki. But I have had issues, and I actually was talking with someone about this today, where they're like, it seems like there's more drivers in the rideshare that don't necessarily know Hawaii, right? They may be um, a military spouse or someone new to the islands, and they'll get you know, a ride into Waikiki and, and get sidetracked on, on one-way roads and stuff. And sometimes you can see where they're at, and you're like, why did you turn that way? You know, like you're like, here you're backseat driving from the app. But that's one thing that I had heard one time, so I thought that was interesting that there is kind of a, a, you know, a knowledge that they're required to have on the cab side. Can I chime Please. in on that? Because what I do want to clarify is there's discussion here of the old rules versus the oh. new rules. The old rules is the city used to, when we had a database of drivers, we issued those tests, we collected uh, their background checks, we did a lot of the driver certification. We no longer do that. Gotcha. It's now up to the businesses to ensure that the level of people they connect with their business meets their personal standards. It's a business model. Sure. And I will say, when I first started this job, Dale invited me over to see her operation. And she has a very first class business operation. I was really impressed with the technology, the training, the type of um, equipment that she has there. And I think that is an edge for every business to decide what works for them. And I think government needs to allow those businesses to have the flexibility to do what they do best. Dale knows her, her, her tri drivers, she knows her market, and we need to allow that. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to hear from, we, we went to the airport and we want to share some other insights from consumers. Let's start with the folks who were at the Uber stand and take a listen. Why Uber versus a taxi? Uh, it's probably quite a bit less in price is what we've been, we've found when we share the difference between the two. You saw the price difference, is that when you switched? Yes. Well, and they're cleaner, I think, too, because there's somebody's car, you know, instead of a taxi. Why use Uber versus a taxi? Uh, it's actually more affordable and they're actually nicer, usually. What's that? What do you mean nicer? Just more courteous. They're nice. They're, they show up on time. There's no calling and waiting and getting a dispatch that's rude. Okay, and in the interest of fairness, let's go straight to the folks who prefer a taxi over an Uber. Let's take a listen. I use a cab when I have to get somewhere quick out of an airport. It's very convenient. Is it more convenient to say like Uber and Lyft? I think it is because you just walk right out and there's a cab stand and there's a guy here who's telling me where to go and he's telling me where to go right now, okay. so got to go. You know, so it does come down to customer choice, to convenience and versus price. When you hear those kinds of comments, I mean, can your drivers compete? Yes, we can compete. The difference is that the quality is different. Like in the taxi, the law says that you must take the shortest, most direct route. So when he says the taxi driver knows, it's because that's the law. The Uber and Lyft drivers don't have to follow that. They use the GPS, but the GPS is, everyone is different. The GPS routing is not accurate. It is not like the taxi meter. It does not comply with the same way that the taxi drivers drive. Shortest, cheapest route. What's your response to that? Yeah, so I think um, one of the benefits of uh, taking an Uber is upfront pricing. And so uh, in the very beginning, you can see exactly how much you're going to pay for your ride. And, you know, the routes can maybe be a little bit different, but it's up to the consumer to decide, is this a fair price? And, and the prices are calculated based on our best guess of traffic, of, you know, the direction of where the person is going. And uh, we will, after the fact, if there is a, um, I believe it's around 10% difference um, in, in what we expected um, at the end of the ride. So if we thought, um, so let's say that you, you know, it looks like your driver may have taken a long route to get where you were going. Uh, we will on the back end adjust. 
what's your response to the idea that um, that the, the drivers for taxis they know more about Hawaii that you might have a, a more you know a richer experience if you take a cab is there a way for uber to incorporate that kind of training so that drivers would be able to kind of match that level of service definitely and you know I think we heard earlier it really depends on the ride that you have and I think that um, you know some of the the people that I hear that take uber they love the, the hospitality they get, the aloha spirit. And you know they'll often say that it felt like I was on a trip with a tour guide. He knew the best places to go get lunch. He knew exactly which beach I should go to. So I think it varies you know, on your experience. Um, but I do think that there's also a, a really large overlap between the drivers. So uh, you know, Dale uh, works with independent contractors, as do we. And so there are a lot of drivers who do both. And so we do have uh, taxi drivers on the platform. We actually have taxis on the platform. So you can get an actual taxi with the dome, with the meter, all of that, if you'd like, as an option on, on the Uber platform. Um, and then we also have taxi drivers who have converted. So they've gone from being a taxi driver for 20, 30 years, and they're now using UberX. So they're now using their personal vehicle. They're now instead using Uber as their platform. Do you think there is room for both? Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, I mentioned it earlier. I think we're all a part of a transportation ecosystem. There's a lot of ways to get around Honolulu, and I think there should continue to be a lot of ways. And people have their preferences, and we think it's about consumer choice. I see you yes. wanted to jump in. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. Yes. Because uh, what I want to ask is your experience in riding cabs and having, uh, or riding Uber and Lyft, and they are like not from there or visitors that are working. Was that here locally yeah, or was that yeah. outside? Yeah. Because one of the requirements that is within the state of Hawaii is that you have a valid Hawaii driver license and so you shouldn't be driving if you are well, I'm, here I'm for a week or two. certain they had Hawaii driver's licenses <laughs> but in, in there's a couple situations where I actually asked I'm like oh so are you you know are you from here or are you new and one person actually said she was uh, new to the islands oh. had moved here and purposefully was driving so she could get experience finding her way around the island which I actually thought was kind of neat mm -hmm. but of course I was the one that had to deal with that <laughs> <laughs> so you do have to establish residency you do have to go through the process of getting a Hawaii driver license and all the documentation and residency that that requires mm -hmm. so many I would think of our TNC drivers need to be local Mm -hmm. right. So we do verify that they have Hawaii State Driver's License. So for the ones that are new to the islands, they do have to go and get the new Hawaii State Driver's License. But that is a requirement by law, and that's something that we make sure. Um, Catherine from Mililani has a question for Dale and says she wonders why Uber and Lyft can tell a rider the exact amount of the ride before pickup, but taxis and cabs won't give the total amount until drop-off. Why is that? Well, actually, the taxi, even if they call, the dispatcher will give them an estimate. Just like Uber and Lyft, they are giving estimates. Okay. Um, this, this was interesting, too. Uh, Deborah wants to know, how does Uber explain its fares only covering 41% of Uber's operating costs as anything other than predatory pricing? Uber touts itself as a way for people to make good money, but it's also working hard on driverless cars. What happens to drivers then? Um, so I will say that in Hawaii, we are a profitable business. This is a long-term business. The, you know, the pricing that we're at is absolutely sustainable, and it works here in Hawaii. When you see headlines about Uber has lost you know, X amount of money, that sort of thing, that's really because we're investing in other parts of the business. So you know, Uber is a platform for ride share, for bike share, for scooters, for all of these things around the world. Um, but we're also in autonomous vehicles. We're also doing autonomous freight. We're, you know, we're interested in a lot of different sectors, and so as a part of that, we're investing in those businesses. Uh, our rideshare business, however, is a different story. That's generating a lot of the funds to fund these new technologies, these new innovations, um, and in Hawaii, we are profitable. Tommy uh, wants to know, uh, do, does Charlie's, I know that Charlie's does fingerprinting, does, uh, do they also do background checks like Uber and Lyft? What kind of safety precautions are for there in place in terms of the drivers? In addition, well, the difference about the, uh, our fingerprinting is that it's not based on names, alias names. Uber and Lyft do not go by fingerprinting. It goes by names. So it's not accurate as far as the driver's background. We also require the FBI background check to find out their um, their felony histories. Okay. Um, I know you said that safety is not a concern for you. Just as a consumer, do you think that there is enough room in this market for both? Oh, absolutely. 
Explain that. And bring on the robots. Like. <laughs> <laughs> bring on those driverless cars. I'm, I'm a technologist. I, lo I love the artificial intelligence. But ultimately, as humans, we kill each other. You know, we're uh, I've statistics anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 people a year die on the roads. You know, so um, didn't mean to hijack that question. <laughs> but ultimately, we're all trying to get like the auto manufacturers are trying to make safer cars. We're, we all want you know to be safer. Right. Um, what about this idea though, that there, there are too many drivers, that you know the market is oversaturated with people who are participating and so you have the kind of figures that Dale was saying that you know you have people who have to quit being taxi drivers um, or there are people you know who do this on the side but that mm -hmm. there are too many. How many drivers do you have right now? Um, so there are a few thousand um, across the island. So we are not only on Oahu, we're also on Maui, Big Island and Kauai as well. So um, across the islands there are a few thousand drivers. The nature of Uber though is very part-time so for most people it is a part-time thing and so when we say thousands of drivers that's not necessarily at one time you know that's just maybe a few hundred drivers and and also I will say that our utilization is very high so when you see uh, when I say that there are a lot of drivers we have a lot of drivers who are on trips and so last year we completed more than four million trips just in Hawaii and so and then around the world we're completing 15 million trips a day so it may seem like there's a lot but um, or a lot of drivers on the road but there are a lot of trips that are happening um, and then you know when you talk about the number of taxi drivers versus the number of Uber and Lyft drivers um, some of them like I said you know some of them have converted and so you know when you say that there's uh, there's been a decrease in taxi drivers I know firsthand of several drivers who used to be taxi drivers that are now exclusively doing Uber or Lyft. And that's because you know they don't have the same overhead costs with, with Uber as they do um, maybe with a traditional taxi company. They're not paying money into us. Uh, they're not, you know, they're already paying for their vehicle. It's their own personal vehicle. Um, and so yeah, many prefer it. Four million rides. Yes. You know, that's good <laughs> that's news for your company. Mm -hmm. When you hear that, what goes through your mind? Well, I kind of surprised because we do about 2.5 or 3 million rides. So if she's using, the, the thing that you can see is the congestion in Waikiki, especially in all the tourist spots. So, but the thing is that because they're using part-timers, it could be that they're just focusing on the tourist traps and that uh, their rides is not that much considering there are thousands of drivers. Do you have a breakdown in terms of how many of the people that are using your services are locals versus uh, visitors? Well, we have because of our higher standards, we have a lot of corporate accounts. So we have about half of our business is uh, tourist related. Okay, and what about what about you? Of those four million, what's the breakdown? Right. Yeah. So um, I'm an operations person, so I'm really interested in learning about how can we better serve our market. Are we serving the right, you know, the right market? And so we have done research on this, and 70% um, of our riders in, on Oahu are local. And so I think a lot of people think that you know maybe we're just serving the tourist areas, but that's really not what we're about. We're we're about serving the entire island, mm -hmm. and you know Waikiki is a part of that, sure. Um, but we do have drivers who are coming from all over the island, and they're giving rides to their neighbors. And we think that it's so amazing that you know there's you have that option if you want to. If you want to get a ride in Mililani, in Kapolei, in Kaneohe, you can do so, and usually within about five minutes. And so, um, yes, we, we believe in serving absolutely the local community, and most of those rides are coming from local riders. What kind of income are those folks making? I know you said this is more mm -hmm. of a side gig than like a full-time job. Right. So on average, what, what are people actually making in this industry? Yeah, you know, and as a part of that, you know, it depends on when you drive, where you drive, you know, there's various factors that go into it because um, there are like busy times, busy areas, that sort of thing. Um, I do know that there have been outside studies on how much Uber and Lyft drivers make um, and I do believe Honolulu is actually the highest in the nation for, for Uber drivers. Um, and from my data and my understanding with talking with drivers, it's usually above $20 per hour, but typically around $25 or so. And how does that compare to what your drivers are making? Um, I, I think our drivers make at least $25, $35 an hour. Okay. Um, David in Waipahu has a question for you and wants to know, why doesn't the city set either fixed rates for both types of businesses or flexible rates for both? Well, right now, that's what we're looking to do. So we have a bill that the mayor has introduced, which is Bill 44, that we're hoping the council will look at because that is going to further level the playing field, we feel. What we believe is that 
for the public's benefit. The pricing needs to be clear and transparent so that the, the user can know the fee before they get in the vehicle and can make an educated decision, is this worth it or not? Do I want to take this or do I want to explore another route of transportation? And we do want to set that. But um, taxis have meters and we have to allow them to make that transition. We're hoping, I think in the future, everyone's going to be using technology. It's just the way things are going, but we have to allow taxi use. Taxis go by turn of the wheel and it goes by distance. And um, right now that's what, we're be what it is being used. But if we can allow a way for taxis to quote a price up front, again, for user knowledge and decision making, that's where we want to be. I know there are a lot of different provisions in that bill, but at its core, does it basically cut the meter or how does that work? Well, if you use technology like an app, then you would be able to let the consumer know what the price is and let them accept it or reject it. And I know you talk about Lyft and um, Uber, but I understand that Dale has also opened a TNC business, which is cutting edge, and that is allowed. If she are, is able to do that and allow the consumer to know what she's pricing, that's perfectly fine. If you go with the meter, though, then what we would like to do is establish the highest rate, because what you have is your, your base rate plus plus baggage, um, all kinds of different fees. We want to roll that all into one per mile, and then you know if I'm going 20 miles and I'm quoted this price, you can have an idea of what you want to pay. Can I just clarify? The thing is that Uber and Lyft are using estimates. They're not fixed rates, except for the upfront pricing. And the difference is this, while the city says that they're going to set that rate, Uber and Lyft can surge price, and the upfront pricing works like this. They charge a higher fare, the customer has to approve of it, the driver gets paid actual miles, the difference goes to Uber and Lyft. So it is basically uh, enriching the companies, not the drivers. So what's your take on that, Bill? Is that something that you're opposing? I think, I think that it screws the consumer, and that's one of the reasons why we have been against the price gouging. The customer knows whether or not they're from a foreign country or a local person. They always know that the meter is calibrated and that they have to take the shortest, cheapest route. So they won't be cheated. The other way that when you're doing surge pricing and upfront pricing, there's a lot of padding in there. What's, the, what's, the, uh, what's Uber's take on this bill? Yeah, I mean, uh, to clarify again, um, the, the statement about how our pricing works when they're surge pricing is um, what Dale has said is, is incorrect. So the way that it actually works is the upfront price is what the, the passenger pays. And if it is slightly increased during higher times, the passenger will know and they'll see that fares are slightly higher. Do you want to accept this trip? Or do you want to wait a few minutes because it refreshes every two minutes? If you'd like to wait, you can. Um, that's an option as well. But if you do accept that higher price, the driver is getting a per mile, a per minute rate, but it's going to be at that higher surge price. And so it doesn't mean that our cut is going to be a higher percentage. Uh, that's not how it works. The driver benefits because the whole point of, of surge pricing really is to, to meet the market demand. And so it's to balance out supply and demand. And that's so that you give the driver an extra incentive to be out at two o'clock in the morning when you know maybe I, I don't want to drive at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> but maybe if you pay me a little bit more money maybe it is worth it and so that's why surge pricing is in place and so that's why it is important that we do pay the driver more during that time you know and I need to please, jump in yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> surge is, is one of those things where it's it's a very easy to misunderstand and it's also a very hot button issue right it sounds kind of horrible at times <laughs> but I, I would like to point out going back a little bit to the number of drivers it's not a zero-sum game like if you take away uber I'm not gonna give my business all to Charlie and I'm not gonna give my business all to another cab because uber's filling in a place that the cab doesn't necessarily fit sometimes, right? And so I make a cognitive decision when I want to go somewhere, what's available to me? And you know, I weigh a number of variables, and everyone does that, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. when Uber wasn't there, I didn't necessarily use the cabs more than I do now. So 
Um, I did things like drive myself when I maybe shouldn't have, like had a couple drinks, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I think that's a big thing. And on Surge, I love it. I love Surge because I know it's there and I know that I have the choice of, and I've done that before. I've been, we've been at the bar and we're like, you know, had a couple drinks. You're like, oh, it's five times right now. Hey, another round, you know? <laughs> so you can wait a little bit longer. But also, the flip side of the coin, if there's no surge, it's me calling the cab company at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock on a Friday and them saying it's going to be an hour for a cab. So to me, that is fantastic. That's an open market and that gives us all of the option as the consumer. I see you shaking your head. Please jump in. <laughs> well, the thing about surge pricing is kind of misleading because actually what happens is that the drivers game the system. They won't log on so that the prices surge and then when the prices surge, they come back on. I'm okay with that. <laughs> are, are, are drivers gaming the system? I, I will say that, you know, we're, we're a technology company, and we know that those sort of things are attempted, and we have so many measures that go against them. So, I mean, everything's run by an algorithm, and this algorithm gets smarter and smarter and smarter. So there's no way for drivers to game the system. It just doesn't work that way. There are so many variables that go into surge, and we know what to look out for. And we, we know how to flag drivers that maybe are attempting fraudulent behavior, um, and we work very hard to make sure that that does not happen. But for this city, the main thing is no matter what the price is, it has to be disclosed to the, dr the right. rider, and the rider has to accept it. If they accept it, then there's no deception. Right. If they turn it down and look for another way, then that's their choice. I, I may regret it in the morning when I wake up, but <laughs> it's still a choice that I made. Well, we did hear in, in those video clips from the from the airport that um, a lot of people were choosing the ride sh the ride hailing services because of price. Um, do you feel like when you get into a taxi, do you feel like you're going to pay more? Not always. Um, it, sometimes, it, you know, it totally it, it varies, and I hate that I keep saying that. But the other thing too is um, I've been able to get Ubers where I can't get a cab. Like, for example, and it's funny that one of the arguments earlier was that, oh, Uber might be just going over and picking up tourists. And it's actually kind of the other way around. The cab drivers love the tourists. They hate the locals. Because I'll be at Aloha Tower having lunch, and I need to get back to my office downtown, and it's only three, four blocks away. But it's a hot day, and I don't want to sweat. They don't want to, pick, they don't want to take me, but I can get an Uber, no problem. So that's kind of you know, the flip side of that coin, too. You know, I clearly I, oh, disagrees. I saw, I saw a head shake in there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead. But you know, I'm in this position, I do a lot of studies. I've taken a lot of rides just for the sake of taking a ride to just explore how it works. And I live near the airport, and I do know the four or five times that I've taken a taxi, they've been a little upset because they pay for the right to pick up a ride at the airport. And to take me just four or five miles, they prefer the week, the Waikiki trip, which I understand. But for the Uber and Lyft, it didn't seem to be a problem. It doesn't matter. Yes. Can I make a, the reason is because the airport has a $5 pickup fee and they are not allowed to pass that on. So the driver loses $5. And that's one of the reasons why. So if she has a short load, say that it's $12, then actually the driver is only making 7 so and the, the Uber and Lyft, they don't, they ha they are able to pass on all those charges. The city regulates our rates excessively, mm -hmm. so that we cannot pass on government taxes, government fees, and like at Aloha Stadium and the Diamond Head, they charge ten dollars. The driver has to lose that. They go to Wanalua Gardens, they have to pay two dollars and fifty cents. Every time they do that, they lose out because the co the ordinance does not allow the drivers to pass on the cost of business, the cost of fees and taxes. That's a really good point. And I would love to say <laughs> this is why 44 exists. Because when I first met Dale, she explained that to me. And you know what? That makes a lot of sense. There are business expenses that can't be passed on. And anytime you set a rate in ordinance to change that, is an act of Congress, right? You, it's so hard. And she explained to me business costs that are not factored in into what the city or government allows them to charge, which is why Bill 44 is an all-in. We want her to be able, we want other taxi companies to be able to charge what they need to charge to get to where their business is successful. Bill 44 allows for that. I know you disagree with that, uh, that Bill 44 may not be the solution. If it's not Bill 44, what's a better way to regulate this so that you guys are all on the same level? Well, the thing is that I think the w one of our basic things is the consumer protections. So like the fingerprinting we think is very essential because there are so many 
thousands of cases where there is sexual abuse, and that's because the background checks that they're doing is inadequate. There are many crimes that are happening, and those things are because of careless and non-existent um, vetting. The vetting is not uh, foolproof. FBI is 99% best, best, and so those, and also I think that it is essential for the customer and the operators to understand that they are going to charge the shortest, most direct route. That benefits consumers. The problem with their system is that because they can charge whatever, the people who can afford it, the people like him, but the people who are low income and are fixed income, they can't afford these surge pricing. The surge pricing, like he said, goes uh, five times. He's willing to pay five times the rate. But there are people who can't afford to do that. In the taxi, you can't do that. And you can't refuse the trip. In their system, you can refuse the trip. You look at the rating, and if you don't like the customer, you can refuse them. In the taxi business, we are just like the buses. You can't discriminate. That, doesn't, uh, that does not uh, apply to them. Would you like to see the regulations on you lifted, or would you like to see regulations added to them? I think on consumer protections that they should be under the same laws. We should have the same rules of the game. I think that the same rules do exist. And I've worked very hard to ensure that they exist. So the previous, again, there was a change when this, um, we used, the city would only regulate taxis. That was our world. And that was the way it was done for decades. And with the inclusion of TNCs, now we develop this umbrella called private transportation companies. The rules changed at that point. And now uh, background checks used to be done by the city for the drivers, but it was only a local check. So if you recall, there was an instance where a driver actually had a sexual assault history in another state. That wouldn't show up on our records because we only did local checks. Now the way we've changed it, it's a national, a national seven year background check is required, but it's done by the companies. Well, now, I fought for that for decades, you know, to, to increase the uh, background checks. So, but the thing is that the fingerprinting was always existing. What happened when Uber and Lyft started to lobby is that they downgraded to the uh, rules so that the, everybody would be under the same. But the thing is they don't have to have a doctor's examination and the doctor's lab, a lab test on how, whether or not they are on drugs or whatever. So those things were downgraded. So yeah, if you can have a low, uh, level playing field, but it's lower. The fingerprints were required, but again, it was only a check in Hawaii. It yeah, wasn't. It, was, it wasn't. It wasn't check. national. But this way, it's a national check. And if companies want to further um, their marketing and say, "Hey, we do background check, we do fingerprint checks," that's their option if they want to take it to the next level. But government will establish the minimum base of what we're accept accepting, and if every company wants to increase that, that's their marketing plan. That's how they tell people what, how they excel over another company. We have a lot of questions coming in. Um, the caller appreciates taxi services for medical appointments and thinks taxi drivers are more prepared to help the elderly in this way. And you do see a lot of elderly folks in Hawaii using um, you know, alternate transportation. So do Uber or Lyft have any special services for, for medical rides? Um, absolutely, so we have a, um, an actual option within the app called Uber Assist. And these are drivers who have gone through a special course and have learned how to do things to help people who need extra assistance. So if it's someone who is blind, who needs you know, help getting to the vehicle, if it's someone who's elderly, uh, they learn how to fold up scooters and properly store them, uh, that sort of thing. So it is an option within the app. And I mean, when it comes down to it, it's, it's really frustrating for us to hear that we're the ones who are not, serve, not, not from this viewer, <laughs> um, but you know, just to hear in discussion that we're not serving the, the overall community or especially these, these special communities, you know, like the older uh, communities, when in fact, you know, we have these products designated just for, for those people and 90% of the time, Uber is cheap, 40% cheaper than a taxi. And so when you say that, you know, they can't afford to ride Uber, that's simply not true. Most people choose us because we're the affordable option. And I think we saw that in a lot of the videos as well. Um, Jenko writing in saying, what state does Uber, do Uber and Lyft pay taxes to? 
local taxis obviously pay state taxes to fund state needs. Uh, this is a company that's obviously mm -hmm. not based here in Hawaii, so how does that work? So we do have a GET license. Yep. We do have um, a license. We're in the DCCA system. Um, we do pay taxes here in Hawaii every single year. Um, we also pay federal taxes. We pay taxes everywhere that we are. And the receipt GE is right on there. So I know. So, I know so in our, uh, we certify they companies, as I mentioned, no longer yes. the driver, but for companies to be certified, they have to show that they have a GE license. That's yes. part of the process to ensure that they have met all the requirements. Right. Okay. Is, there is a concern from Jenko and from other viewers that um, that since these are outside companies, that mm -hmm. overall the, the state is not benefiting in the same way. Right, so we do pay our taxes and also um, you, you know we're paying our taxes because for us to get things like our airport permit, uh, we had to get a tax clearance. And so that's making sure that we are paying our taxes. So um, it is something that we do everywhere that we operate. Can I just clarify, they as a contractor, their company has to provide the GE tax clearance or the IRS tax clearance, not the drivers. In our situation, the drivers have to have the tax clearances. And explain to me what's the difference. Oh, because every driver is an independent contractor, so he has to have his own tax clearance, his own license. Okay. So when they go for the uh, for the airport permit, only the company provides the tax clearance, not the drivers. Right. So I'll clarify: the city requires that every company has a GE, a general excise tax clearance, and they. So Uber pays, Charlie's pay, but it's up to them to ensure that their drivers also claim their income and pay their excise tax, their income tax based on their earnings. So that's the company's kuleana to do that. Okay. Um, I hate to pile on, but we're getting yeah, so many sure. questions for you that I want to ask. So Chris in Honolulu wants to know how ride-sharing companies compensate for traffic and delays since cabs can keep their meter running, mm -hmm. but obviously you've estimated the ride ahead of time. So right. if they run into an accident, too bad. Right. So, I mean, it, and it's not a too bad situation and as far as we're concerned. Um, you know, we do have the upfront prices and if anything at the end of the ride, so say you get into, um, or you get into this really bad traffic that we did not anticipate. Um, taking it back a step further actually though, we as a technology company, we're constantly gathering information about the cities we're in. And so we know that at 5 p.m., that's rush hour in this very specific area, we know that the last 100 trips in this area, the average time it took was this amount. This is, um, and so we factor that in into the upfront price. So we try to take that into account. You know, in the, the, the times where we can't predict, you know, where there's traffic caused by an accident, if the, if the trip does go, say, 30 minutes longer than we expected, um, there is a, an, an option for us to, um, so if the, if the fare is like a certain margin outside, we may contact the rider and say, hey, this trip was longer than anticipated, and so um, this trip is actually going to cost a little bit more. Or, in the more likely case, when it's out of their control, we eat the cost there. So then the drive would the driver get the driver some more money? is always compensated for miles and um, distance or so, I'm sorry for distance and time so let's say the driver thought they were gonna make ten dollars for this ride mm -hmm. um, but it took twice as long do they then get twenty dollars or how does that work? Uh, they'll get they'll get whatever time they spent on the ride and so oftentimes um, you know we sometimes we'll pass it back along to the rider we will let them know that hey your fare has changed just due to the the change in the distance or time I'm sorry the change in the time in this sort of instance um, but oftentimes, too, we will eat some of the costs there. So I'd like to ask a question because I know mm -hmm. you eat the cost if it goes over. Mm -hmm. But if you do contact the, the passenger and say, hey, passenger, this ride is going longer. It's going to cost more. Mm -hmm. If they accept it, fine. What if they don't accept it? Um, you know, then that would be something that would go straight to our customer service department. And at the end of the day, we're a business and we want to make sure our customers are happy. Our, we want repeat customers. And so there's a very likely chance that we would make sure that customer was happy at the but end. But if they the say no, do you mm -hmm. make them get out of the car? Oh, no. We would you never. Finish, <laughs> you finish the ride. Absolutely. But then they'd have to pay that higher rate and um, then settle it later? Right. So, I mean, you? yeah, if they if they didn't accept the fare, then that's something that our customer service department would deal with. We would never, you know, abandon someone. Okay, in the good. I just want to make much about mm -hmm. the, the, their fares. They say that we don't have, but we, the taxis have long, for decades, had flat rates. So we have flat rates no matter what is the time of day. It's always lower than the meter. Mm -hmm. Our rates are always lower than the meter. 
Right. So the city ordinance does allow taxi rates, taxi cabs to charge a certain flat rate fee, but they must run the meter and it has to be less than what the meter says. Mm -hmm. So they can't charge a flat rate, run the fee, run, run the meter, and if the meter says less than the flat rate quoted, they can't charge that flat rate. So it's whatever is the lower price. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I see. They have that option. Oh, I did not know that. Didn't know that either. Um, <laughs> that's good to know. Yeah. Chase from Salt Lake has a question for you, Dale, say, asking, since the ride-hailing companies have proved successful here and around the world, why doesn't the taxi industry change their business model to be more like the ride-sharing companies? How easy or difficult is that to kind of try to adapt? Well, like I said, it, it basically is on the consumer protections. As far as the technology, my technology exceeds uh, Uber and Lyft. So we have better technology, we have more technology, we have safety and security technology. We have cameras in the car that will protect the customers and the drivers. And if something happens in the car and uh, the customer has either a domestic dispute or is having a health issue, radio turns on, they, don't, they can't hear it, but the dispatcher can hear. And the thing is that we can contact the police or the uh, ambulance and then they can help. I love the cameras in her cars. I mean, that's <laughs> such a good feature to keep both the drivers safe and the passenger. That it is a good feature, and that is a marketing for her company. Mm -hmm. It's something extra. It's not something that the city requires, but it's something that they offer, and it's a wonderful thing. Ultimately, a camera's not going to stop someone from physically harming you. A cam you, know, you know, when we deal with surveillance systems for you know businesses and other people, a camera is there for litigation purposes. At the right, end but of I, I will share this that one of my my beliefs is the system for technology is the ability to pay for your ride with no cash. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems with taxis is having an amount of cash in the vehicle encourages that crime element. And I always worry about our taxi drivers. And if I think some of use some of them use credit cards now? Oh, they are, they, yeah. So if more cabs used cashless See, and that's, that's a hot button issue too. Well, then the problem with that... True for the rider. Yes, because yes. a lot of times the cab drivers will try to force us to pay cash because they're avoiding fees or taxes maybe. Under but, the table you're saying? You're yeah, so uh, and that was a big issue I had before Uber existed here. I would call up and say, hey, I'd like a cab to go to X, Y, and Z, and I need one that takes credit cards. And they'd say, sure, no problem, da, da, da. And then the cab driver would be like, can you pay cash? Can I take you to an ATM or whatever? And there was a few times where I just didn't want to argue. I'm like, all right, whatever. But there was one time where I literally didn't have cash. You know, I had a credit card. And I actually called the dispatch while I was in the cab. And I said, hey, I said I needed a cab that takes credit cards. And the dispatch lady said, yes, all of our cabs take credit cards. And that's when it was kind of like, well, what does that mean? But ultimately, the guy then got out his machine and did, did the credit card. But well, I guess for whatever reason, a lot of cab drivers don't No, but even that. if they don't have the credit card machine, which all of our drivers have credit card machines, but the companies do process the credit cards manually. So they call, just like if you go to a store and the credit card doesn't work, they can do the manual. So they do. And the thing is that the problem with their kind of system is the credit card has to be present and you have to authorize the amount of the charge. In their kind of system, they're automatically charged and the customer has to then call and dispute it after the fact. Another thing too is that their kind of system is subject to hacks. When they, when they use a credit card in our system, it's not stored, so there's no hacking. Okay, we have just a few minutes left, so I want to give you each like one final thought. Um, you know, just going back to sort of the premise of the discussion is can these companies coexist? Obviously, there are a lot of differences of opinions between all of you on this very hot topic. How do you see this going forward? I mean, how, how do we make sure that drivers who want to drive for cabs can do it and make a living and drivers who want to drive for Uber can do the same and that the customer gets the best result? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we really believe in choice and we believe we're a part of this transportation ecosystem. So absolutely, we can coexist. And I think we have been coexisting. I think the, the important thing for everyone to realize is that we should be moving forward together. You know, we shouldn't be fighting about, you know, the details of insurance or, you know, all of these things that are just not true about our company when because the city has regulated us under this umbrella as Sherry mentioned and there are so many of the same rules that apply to both of us and I think there's this old notion that we're not regulated that we're not doing the same things that taxi is doing there are very few differences now between the rules that apply to us and that apply to taxi so I think it's really important that we all just work together and you know we move forward and try not to to pit one against the other 
How do you think we best go forward in this? Well, I don't think that it's a matter of competition. I think, however, that this show, the program, illustrates that the attention is diverted away from our real transportation crisis. Number one, we have a severe traffic congestion problem. We are number two worst in the whole world, in the U United States. As far as our roads, we have terrible pothole roads. We have uh, the Americans Disabilities Act. The city is in violation. The thing is that there's not enough supply. So it's not, uh, Honolulu has uh, the highest amount of elderly and disabled. The, um, we're diverting attention from all of these uh, problems, such as we have the lowest roads per capita in the United States and the territories. There are many transportation issues that are being buried because of this kind of discussion. Okay, we have just a minute left. I want to get to both of you. So very quickly, how do you think just we quickly, best Just quickly, the one forward? biggest thing to us is to ensure there's clear and transparent pricing for the consumer and a level of safety and security for the companies to offer. But one thing I want to say is I have not received one complaint from a driver in the last, I'm sorry, from a passenger in the last year. However, I have had a lot of discussion with drivers that are complaining about harassment from other Uber or taxi drivers. So it's sad for me because we live in the same community. We need to learn to work together and live together. So I'd love to see a little more cooperation, a little more tolerance. Um, it's our culture. It's, it's what makes us. Uh, okay. We got 20 seconds. So very quickly, <laughs> will you continue to oh, ride both? Open playing field. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, if the taxi meter is a problem, let's, let's get rid of the taxi meter and let them evolve. All right, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. We, of course, thank our guest, Tabitha Chow, head of Uber Hawaii, Sherry Kajiwara, director of the Honolulu City and County Department of Customer Services, Dale Evans, CEO of Charlie's Taxi, and Derek Gabriel, consumer of both ride-hailing and taxi services. Next week, Insights takes a break to celebrate Thanksgiving, and in two weeks, we'll be back for a discussion about pedestrian safety. Join us for Dangerous Crossings. That's on November 29th. In the meantime, have a safe Thanksgiving holiday. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Ho.